In November of 1873, a sheep rancher named Judge W.H. Baldwin died after stumbling into a well. Uh, by all accounts, he was a man unacquainted with sobriety. Um, also, he wasn't a real judge. He had judged a sheep competition at one point, and that's why people uh, called him judge. He lived in El Paso County. The other important thing about Judge W.H. Baldwin, Baldwin was that he was known as the only Democrat in El Paso County, or at least the only outspoken Democrat in El Paso County. I suppose for beleaguered Democrats today in El Paso County, they would say that nothing much has changed since Judge W.H. Baldwin's death. But of course, things have changed. Um, even though Colorado Springs and El Paso County are overwhelmingly conservative locations, uh, here in uh, El Paso County, we have the 5th Congressional District, uh, represented by Doug Lamborn. It's the third most Republican district in the country. So this is still a very Republican place. Uh, but nevertheless, there are some important differences. For today's talk, uh, firewall or failure, the uh, 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 Colorado Springs and the, uh, and the presidential election, I want to talk about the reputation of Colorado Springs, uh, the record of Colorado Springs on presidential elections and other elections, and then also the results that we can expect from this upcoming presidential election. Uh, the first thing that we have to uh, confront whenever we talk about politics in Colorado Springs is the reputation of the city. Colorado Springs has a reputation as being a bastion of conservatism, but not a bastion of conservatism generally, but a, the bastion of a particular type of conservative, most importantly, evangelical conservatives. Um, the best example of this and how it has this reputation, it's not just the reputation here, but it's a global reputation. So in 2005, the famous uh, British biologist and outspoken and very combative atheist Richard Dawkins decided to take a Margaret Mead-like expedition uh, to the United States where he could see irrational faith uh, being exercised. And the location he chose to come study was Colorado Springs. And he found here in Colorado Springs a strange tribe of people nestled against uh, the Colorado Rockies, still practicing in his mind this irrational uh, uh, faith. Uh, what he found here, he went to New Life uh, Church, he went by Focus on the Family, he of course found out uh, everything that he wanted. Uh, all the examples of religious belief and particularly evangelical religious belief uh, were here. And so people have this uh, view of Colorado Springs. It's extended all the way to England. You see it today. Uh, the New York Times uh, just a couple of years ago after the last gubernatorial election said that Colorado is home to the backpackers of Boulder and the Bible thumpers of Colorado Springs. Right? So this is what people think about when they think of Colorado Springs. And so Colorado Springs is transparently, particularly to the left in America, particularly to, uh, uh, to liberals, the dark beating heart of the relig religious right. Uh, and therefore, it is hostile territory. And for a long time, Democrats thought that there was no real good reason to try and contest uh, elections here in Colorado Springs and El Paso County. It turns out that the truth of Colorado Springs and the truth of El Paso County is much different than what the reputation of the city and the county actually is. It turns out that evangelicals and social uh, conservatives are a prominent part of the city's population, but far from dominant. If you look at church attendance figures, only about 20% of the population of Colorado Springs atten attends church regularly. That's much lower than the national average. Only about 37% of the population actually belongs to a religious, religious congregation. Once again, that's below the national average. Uh, interestingly, it's below Denver, it's below New York City, and it's below, of all places, San Francisco. Uh, so, in a way, Colorado Springs is a remarkably unchurched, irreligious place uh, compared to the rest of the country. But because we have prominent evangelical institutions like Focus on the Family, uh, The Navigators, Compassion International, people think of it as a place that's just dominated by evangelicals and the location of an incipient theocracy uh, or maybe an al already a theocracy. So the reality is much, uh, uh, much different. Why do we have this mi mischaracterization, though, of Colorado Springs and, and El Paso uh, County? One reason is just uh, very easy to lazily equate conservatives with evangelicals. And if you look at the national conservative movement, it's much more complex and complicated than just evangelicalism. 
Uh, during the Cold War, you had a three-legged stool for the national conservative movement. You had social conservatives, you had national defense conservatives, and you had economic conservatives. It turned out that most people in that group probably had some uh, affection for uh, different attributes of the other part, but there were these differences uh, uh, in, the, in, the con in the conservative movement. And you actually see that here in Colorado Springs. So the mischaracterization, I think, is the result of the fact that the, the city is, uh, is overwhelmingly conservative. Uh, Republicans outnumber Democrats two to one in El Paso County. Today there are 177,000 uh, Republicans, about 94,000 Democrats, and 150,000 unaffiliated voters in Colorado Springs. What this indicates uh, for Colorado is that El Paso County and Colorado Springs is the firewall preventing a complete democratic takeover the, uh, of the state. Today, people like to call Colorado a purple state. It's not red or blue, but purple. That means it's contested. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in the upcoming election, where we certainly know how South Carolina is going to vote, and we certainly know how California is going to vote. We don't know how Colorado will vote. Uh, the one thing that keeps Colorado from tipping completely into the, uh, to the blue side of the ledger is El Paso County and all of these Republican voters and these unaffiliated voters who nevertheless vote Republican. Uh, when it comes to get, when they actually get into the ballot box, uh, the, the, the voting booth, um, most of them end up voting, uh, voting Republican. Um, what else explains the mischaracterization or what explains, explains the conservative character of the city? I think more than anything else actually is the military. Uh, the military is a much more a dominant force in Colorado Springs politics uh, than, uh, than evangelicals. Uh, it turns out that there's a very big debate about whether there's such a thing as the military vote. Uh, you, you just look at how members of the military vote and they vote Republican. Uh, uh, overwhelmingly, particularly the Office Corps, and that's imp important for Colorado Springs. But when you control for other factors like race, religion, um, uh, wealth, income, uh, it's not clear that it's being a member of the military which is responsible for the way the Office Corps votes or whether or not it's these other attributes or factors which in in induce them to vote, uh, to vote Republican. For our purposes, though, uh, the important fact is, is that you have a lot of members of the military who retire in Colorado, Colorado Springs and therefore they vote in Colorado Springs, particularly a lot of members of the officer corps. It's difficult to get really good numbers uh, on this, but the estimates show a, a very significant part of the population is retired military and particularly uh, retired officer corps. And so that lends a very conservative flavor to the, uh, to the city's politics. Uh, a couple of other things that make Colorado Springs a conservative city. Uh, you have this old Western Republican strain uh, to Colorado City politics, uh, or Colorado Springs, poli uh, Colorado Springs politics, uh, what you would call the Barry Goldwater wing of the Republican Party. You talk about Rocky Mountain Republicans. What do they typically look like? They're basically leave-me-alone conservatives, right? very libertarian in their politics, and particularly on economic policy. So if you don't tax them, they tend to be happy. And if you look at Colorado Springs politics, that's the most powerful voice that out there, I think, is just leave, it, leave, uh, leave me alone. You, of course, have business interest as well uh, that lend a conservative uh, flavor to the city's politics, but it's not as prominent, I think, as people uh, uh, think that it is. Uh, so I think the two most important elements in the city's politics are these sort of libertarian uh, voters and the military voters, more, uh, more than, anything, uh, than anything else. But what that also indicates, though, is that this, the city's politics are more complicated than uh, it appears uh, to, to people on the outside, and even to some people within Colorado Springs. Uh, they view the city's politics as being dominated by, once again, these evangelicals, and it's much, uh, much different than that. What that means for presidential elections uh, is that if the voters of Colorado Springs are more complicated uh, than you would think, uh, there might be some chances for Democrats to make inroads in Colorado Springs. Uh, there is another factor, though, that plays a role in Colorado Springs and the presidential election, and that's just the general growth in our population. Uh, for years, you could hardly get a Democratic candidate to come to Colorado Springs. They just wouldn't come. Instead, they'd go to Denver, and then they would drive through Colorado Springs on their way to Pueblo, which is a Democratic bastion in the state. Uh, in 2008, Barack Obama started doing something different. He started coming to Colorado Springs, devoting a lot of resources to Colorado Springs. Well, why would he do that? Simply because even though Republicans dominate in Colorado Springs, there's still a lot of Democrats. Uh, 94,000 Democrats today. That far exceeds the number of Democrats in Pueblo. 
Uh, from 1970 to, uh, to today, Colorado Springs population went from about 235,000 to around 620,000. The population of Pueblo went from around 100,000 to around 160,000. So that means that even though there are uh, uh, a lot of Republicans here, there's still a number of Democrats. And the, the problem for Democrats is getting them to, uh, to vote, getting them to, to go and vote. They tend to, Democrats in Colorado Springs can get demoralized. You have a lot of uh, races where you don't even have a Democratic candidate, for instance, for the state senate or the House of Representatives. And when you don't have uh, Democrats uh, being competitive in those other races, it's difficult to get Democrats motivated to go out and vote. And so what Barack Obama tried to do and was successful in doing in 2008 was dramatically increasing the Democratic vote in El Paso County. Because even if you didn't win El Paso County, if you could increase your support in El Paso County, it would significantly improve your chances in, in, in the rest of the state. I think that will become significant as we move into this presidential election. All right, so what is the record then? The reputation of Colorado Springs is a certain type of conservative. It's not really the case. It's much more complicated. Uh, when you add that to the just general population growth, it means that it's not going to be an extraordinarily rich harvest uh, in Colorado Springs for Democrats, uh, but there's going to be a harvest there uh, if you take the time, as Democrats have in 2008 and 2010, to actually try and get, uh, get their voters to, the, uh, to the, uh, the polls. So what's been the record of Colorado Springs, particularly on, on presidential elections? You go back to 1876, Colorado has voted in 35 presidential elections. The Republican candidate has won 23 times. The Democratic candidate has won the state 11 times. A populist candidate in 1892 won it one time. Uh, so historically, Colorado, and not just Colorado Springs, has voted Republican in presidential elections. This has been even more true. Uh, Republican dominance has been even greater since 1972. Since 1972, Republicans have won the state eight times and Democrats just twice. And one of those you have to put an asterisk, uh, asterisk by because uh, Ross Perot ran in 1992 and he got 23% uh, of the vote in Colorado. And if Perot had not uh, run in uh, 1992, I I think uh, George Bush would have won Colorado and very well might have won the presidential election. But Perot took so much support from Bush that it ruined his chances in Colorado and also nationwide. Uh, Bill Clinton only got 40% of the vote in Colorado in 1992. Uh, so really that was an aberrant uh, election. And the one that really matters is 2008. Uh, what really matters is 2008. If you look at those elections since uh, 1972, not just presidential elections, but also any statewide election. Uh, for a major office, governor or senate. Uh, you've seen one particular pattern, and that is if the Republican candidate gets more than 65% of the vote in El Paso County, the Republican candidate wins the race. If the Republican candidate gets less than 60% of the vote in El Paso County, he loses the statewide race. I think there's only one exception uh, to that, and that was 1976. I believe Gerald Ford only got 59% of the vote in Colorado, but he still won Colorado. Of course, he still lost the election. Um, so what does that show for Republicans? Uh, uh, what Republicans have had to do is run up the score in Colorado Springs and El Paso County. Right? If they can get their people to, uh, to, uh, to the polls and get this huge turnout, 65% plus, uh, they win. If it gets below 60%, uh, almost always they lose. If it's in between 60 uh, uh, and 65%, it, it's a pretty tight race and it uh, indicates a good deal of uncertainty about what the, uh, what the outcome will be. So that's what, we'll, uh, uh, what we've seen. Uh, the other exception, of course, was the, the governor's race in 2010, but that was also bizarre because the Republican Party just self-destructed uh, and you had a split of the conservative vote. And so um, you can't really uh, look at the, the 2010 gubernatorial election as an indication of much other than the fact that Republicans fell apart <laughs> in, in that election and it allowed John Hickenlooper to really walk into the uh, uh, walk walk into the governor's mansion. Um, but let's look at 2008. Let's look at 2008 and what Barack Obama did in El Paso County uh, in 2008 and how this is indicative of, other, of these larger trends with statewide races in, in Colorado. Uh, Barack Obama held John McCain to under 60 percent of the vote in, in 2008. Uh, John McCain got about 59 percent of the vote in El Paso County. 
um, uh, Barack Obama got about 39 percent of the vote uh, in El Paso County, close, uh, cl close to 40 percent. But how did he do that? Uh, how did he do that? And this leads us, I think, to the final point about the, what kind of results can we expect from this election? How did Barack Obama manage to, to close the gap so significantly uh, from 2004? We had seen uh, George Bush get well north of 65 percent of the vote in El Paso County. Um, George Bush got about 161,000 votes in El Paso County in 2004. Uh, John Kerry got about 77,000 votes in 2004. In 2008, Barack Obama got uh, 109,000 votes, and John McCain got 160,000 votes. So the way that Barack Obama closed the gap in uh, Colorado Springs and El Paso County was not so much by cutting into Republican support. Uh, you didn't see a huge drop-off in the Republican vote uh, from 2004 to 2008. Instead, what you saw was a dramatic increase in the Democratic vote in El Paso County in 2008. In fact, in 2004, there were a total of about 241,000 votes cast in El Paso County. In 2008, uh, around 273,000 votes. So that was an increase of about 32,000 votes. Almost all of that increase came from the support from John Kerry to Barack Obama. You saw the Democratic vote going from 77,000 to 109,000, so just about 32,000 votes. So what Barack Obama did very effectively in El Paso County was encourage Democrats, encourage his supporters to get out and vote. Right? So that's what he's going to have to try and do again in 2012. This leads me to my final uh, comments on the Colorado Springs, El Paso County, and the presidential election is what can, what, what can we expect in Colorado uh, in, in 2012? I don't think there's any chance that Barack Obama is going to be able to re repeat his performance in Colorado uh, in 2000, uh, from 2008 and 2012. I think that's all, almost entirely impossible. You just look at the polls today, there's just no way that he's going to win Colorado by nine points. The question is whether or not he's going to take the state at all. It very well might come down to how well the get out the vote effort in El Paso County comes down, uh, uh, how, how well the get out the vote effort for the Obama campaign is in El Paso County, and that might determine the outcome uh, here in, in 2012. What I would expect, though, uh, is that you'll see significant attrition in the Democratic vote, particularly in El Paso County. Uh, 2008 was a very unusual election. Uh, you had a very compelling candidate for the Democratic Party. Um, lots of people were really excited. They felt very good about voting for, for Barack Obama as a person. It was a historic election for a variety of reasons, which we all know. Um, that's faded uh, since 2008. The hope and change has uh, had to turn to the, the hard and real facts of governing. And it's very easy to get people excited uh, about voting for someone when they haven't held office or haven't held that particular office because they've been uncorrupted. Uh, they look uh, pure and clean. But it turns out that the, the process of governing is a, is a pretty ugly process. And when people see their candidate uh, getting sullied uh, by that process, it tends to diminish their support and their willingness to get out to, uh, uh, to vote for them, to go out and vote for them. And that's certainly ha happened with Barack Obama. People just aren't as excited about going and vote, uh, voting for him this election as they were in, two, in 2008. And you've seen this just with the, uh, the Democratic campaign. They're obviously very worried uh, about the motivation of their, uh, of their supporters. I think this is going to be particularly difficult uh, in a place like El Paso County. Here in El Paso County, it's still uh, overwhelmingly Republican, and Republicans are eager to vote. They aren't just eager to vote against Barack Obama. They were going to turn out and vote regardless. I mean, the core of the Republican Party was going to turn out and vote against Barack Obama no matter what uh, in this election. But other Republicans who probably weren't as excited or enthusiastic in uh, 2008, they're going to show up this time around. There was some population growth from 2004 to 2008, so just given the natural uh, population uh, trends, you should have ex expected more uh, a larger Republican vote in 2008. Those people are going to show up this time around because they're eager to vote against Barack Obama. But also now it appears that they're anxious to vote for Mitt Romney. Uh, up until the, uh, the first presidential debate, uh, that wasn't the case. 
you sensed that Republicans weren't terribly excited about their candidate, but when they saw Mitt Romney put on a good show, uh, give a good performance against Barack Obama, they became excited. Uh, and so that's going to tend to increase uh, the Republican vote here in El Paso County. So my expectation would be that Mitt Romney will get well north of 60% of the vote in El Paso County and very well might exceed 65% of the vote in El Paso County. Now historically, if you get uh, above 65% of the vote and you're a Republican, you win the race in Colorado. I'm not certain that that's necessarily the case this time around. There have been significant demographic uh, trends uh, that have affected Colorado since uh, 2000. You've seen a large influx of Californians, particularly to the Denver area, the, uh, the, the suburban Denver area, and their politics tend to be very mixed. Some of them move uh, or leave California uh, to escape the politics of California, so they're Republicans. But others bring the politics of California with them, uh, which is over, uh, overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly Democratic. The other uh, significant demographic uh, change in Colorado is you've seen a, a sizable increase in the Latino population in, in, in Colorado. It's gone from about 17% to 20%. And when you're looking at a, state, a close statewide race, uh, an increase, even though it's not double digits, uh, just a few digits actually, uh, can still be enough uh, to, to, get, to swing an election. And we know that the Latino vote typically uh, goes Democratic, um, particularly in, in, pres in presidential elections. So Mitt Romney could very well uh, exceed 65% uh, of the vote in El Paso County but lose the election. So um, uh, Mitt Romney then not only has to really run the score up in El Paso County, he has to do well enough in the, the, the suburban ring of Denver uh, to, uh, to win the, president, uh, the, the presidential race here in Colorado, particularly the inner suburban ring. Arapahoe County, for instance. The, the outer suburbs of Denver, they vote Republican. Denver itself vote, uh, self votes dem, uh, Democratic. It's that inner suburban ring of Denver where the election uh, is most likely going to be decided. But of course, once again, if you're Bar Barack Obama and you can increase your vote in El Paso County by 20,000 votes uh, compared to John Kerry's performance, I assume Barack Obama would actually like to see that increase from 2004 going up to about 30,000. Uh, or uh, 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 probably 40,000 from 30,000, so increase another 10, 15, uh, 20, uh, 20,000 20, votes. That's going to serve you very well uh, in Colorado and in, in 2012. And when you have an extremely tight uh, presidential election, uh, that could be enough uh, uh, to give you the race. And right now, you just look at the way the electoral map is shaping up. Uh, I would say that if we have a close election, uh, in November, it's going to come down to Ohio and Colorado. Those are going to be the two states uh, that we're going to be waiting up on election, uh, election night looking at, seeing uh, how they end up voting. So uh, you're going to, in the next few weeks, um, here in El Paso County, here in Colorado Springs, both campaigns are going to be very active in trying to get their supporters out, get them motivated. Uh, try to get them to uh, 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 try to get them uh, to vote early, but certainly as we approach election day, uh, we're going to be bombarded uh, in Colorado Springs with lots of people coming on knock, knocking on your door, lots of uh, lots of commercials. Uh, what that indicates is that we matter, right? and President Obama thinks that Colorado Springs matters. He's shown that by his many many visits uh, to Colorado Springs and to Colorado. Uh, and of course Mitt Romney thinks uh, that Colorado Springs matters and that's also been shown by his many trips uh, here, here, to Colorado, uh, here to Colorado Springs. So um, for people in Colorado Springs, this is an opportunity. Right? Very few people in America actually have the chance to influence an election. Um, most people vote in states where their vote really doesn't matter. Uh, but the voters in Colorado and the voters in Colorado Springs, their votes matter and the campaigns have shown that it's mattered.